Salam's COP27 is underway in Egypt. We have early updates, plus we look at whether loss and damages will become just a catchphrase or whether it might lead to an actual climate fund. What are the prospects for lasting peace in Ethiopia? And why is a UK Minister of Trade visiting Taiwan? Prashant and Anish of People's Dispatch will join us on the show today to talk about some of these questions. First up, the United Nations COP27 Climate Summit began, as many of us know, on Sunday, the 6th of November with attending countries agreeing to discuss a deal for richer, developed nations to provide financial support as well as reparations to economically more vulnerable countries who are suffering most immediately from loss and damage due to human-induced climate change. The 27th uh, Conference of Parties to, to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, is scheduled to last for two weeks and also, as many of us already know, is being held in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. The summit began late because of intense negotiations regarding the agenda itself. But now that things are officially underway, Prashant, like I said earlier, is in studio to discuss with me what is up at this chronicle of climate chaos. Uh, Prashant, good to have you back in studio. Uh, latest updates or early updates from COP27? Right, Sinan. So, I mean, this is just the first few days of uh, the COP meeting, the conference of parties as it's, as it's called and we have a huge number of people tens of thousands of people from almost every country in the world gathering and lots of world leaders about 120 or so mm. now the first few days are going to be a largely about uh, you know leaders speaking delivering uh, remarks about how it's an urgent issue we're going to have all the regular statements that we expect uh, some political grandstanding people also playing to their galleries at home yeah. we know for instance that boris johnson was also there made some snarky comments you know trying to make a political point but you know the first few days are probably on the one hand you're going to see uh, this uh, public phase of the event so to speak on mm -hmm. the other hand back backroom negotiations also taking place so it's a bit too early to talk about you know conclusions as of now but what some of the initial uh, this is also a good time to actually take stock of what basically the extent of the problem is and this extent of the problem is quite bad because I think uh, the most recent reports that have come out show that the proposal or the hope of reducing uh, the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, yeah. which is the which has been the hope for the longest time. Mm. That is going to be very difficult to meet. So, according to the current pledges made by countries to cut carbon emissions, to sort of uh, you know uh, say ameliorate the impact of climate change, according to the current pledges, we are looking at a 2.5 degree increase by the end of the century. Now, this is going to have disastrous impacts by the end of the century, of course. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about what's happening now separately. Mm. But a 2.5 <clears> degree <throat> Celsius is going to be disastrous. It's going to, you know, cause ma mass levels of extinction, huge rise in uh, water, in, in sea levels, for instance, droughts, fires. The very geography of the planet in some sense is the very nature of human civilization, mm. which has remained more or less constant for hundreds of years in various ways, is likely to be under threat if such an increase takes place. And the fact is that, unfortunately, that there doesn't seem to be too much action that is uh, taking place on the ground. Countries making pledges, of course, but that's really not enough. Yeah. Now, that's one part of it. The other part of it, of course, is that right now, there is an ongoing disaster taking place. And uh, sometimes while talking about climate change, we really kind of forget about that because you tend to sort of pitch it as a future danger. Mm. But the fact is that right now across the world, we've been seeing the impact of this. We saw the disastrous floods in Pakistan, which claimed the lives of over 1,700 people. We've seen droughts, we've seen fires, we've seen flash floods, extreme weather events of all sorts taking place, unseasonal rain, storms, which are wrecking havoc which are destroying lives across the planet. Yep. And all this are all these are linked to climate change. Yep. And the fact is that, so it's it's wrong on the one hand to call it, you know, a kind of future disaster, so to speak. Mm. And that's one part of it. On the other hand, of course, many of these events are also contributing to what is already a grave crisis for a large part of the world's population. If you look at an issue like hunger, if you look at an issue like education, malnutrition, poverty, all these are being accentuated by climate change, of course, but all these are also... But combating and dealing with all these are also essential to actually deal with climate change because, you know, what is the point of uh, a Green New Deal or, you know, some kind of uh, action on renewable energies which makes small sections of the people rich mm. through that process while a bulk of the world remains poor and unable to, uh, you know, uh, hold on to any shred of humanity, so to speak. So, I think these are all questions which are not really being uh, addressed and a lot of this is because of the fact that 
technological solutions are important, pledges are important, but there's also a question of capitalism itself. Yeah. And that is a debate which does not come into COP27 at all. Right? Because unless the way society is structured, which is right now capitalism, mm. is changed, we are not going to, we are not seeing a, prob, a, a solution to many of the core questions posed by the climate crisis. And of course, one important point to note is that this is also being used by Egypt to whitewash its image, yeah. whereas uh, Al Abdul Fateh, tens of thousands of other political prisoners are suffering horrible uh, you know, conditions in prisons. Allah is on a hunger strike. He's apparently stopped consuming water. So very important to keep a uh, watch on that as well. Right. Uh, you, you, you brought up multiple issues there, Prashant, which also opens up so much space for conversation. But because we're limited on time, uh, the aspect I think we can stick to today is uh, it, as an immediate counter to some of those immediate impacts, the global south and particularly like countries in Asia that have seen the most impact of these recent uh, disasters uh, are talking about loss and damages. Uh, now, it's a good starting point. Uh, how, how do you see this kind of impacting the overall negotiations? Right, so loss and damage, uh, it's going to be one of those terms which is going to become popular all across the world mm -hmm. right now. So loss and damage is something that's been around for some time. It's basically the, the, the question of the demand is for financing, for money basically, yeah. to sort of, uh, uh, you know, adapt, to help countries adapt to the, all, what is already existing right now. It's mm -hmm. not about future changes. It is basically to help, to compensate countries for the suffering they're already going through. So it's not surprising that Pakistan introduced a resolution on the behalf of uh, the G77 plus China, it's called a group of countries. Mm. And now this is something that has been resisted by the West for the longest time. In yeah. fact, last year it also came up. At that point, the West made some noises, but refused to commit for a fund per se. They said, you know, we'll discuss it, etc. Mm. Now it's come back on the agenda. We can be sure that the West is again going to sort of try to delay it as much as possible because the moment you agree to it, you have to commit uh, to money. Now, an important thing to note in this context is that there was already a commitment that $100 billion a year would be uh, you know, assigned or would be given for a climate fund, and that hasn't happened. In fact, what the amount that has been pledged, a lot of it, uh, the, the pledges have been inflated, or they actually countries are not paying so much, according right. to Oxfam. Yeah. And equally importantly, the fact is that a huge amount of this money is in the form of loans. Mm. So basically, countries are going into debt. Yeah, and are trapped in that cycle. <laughs> yeah, are being then. further trapped into that debt cycle mm. uh, while trying to adjust to climate change. And we need to remember, leaders are already pointing this out, that a lot of the emissions, that we talk, carbon emissions that we're talking about, are due to colonialism. They're mm. due to exploitation. They're due to the kind of industrial empires that the Western countries were able to build up by extracting resources yeah. from the global south. <clears throat> so in that way, it is, it is a core question of justice over generations that we're talking about here. Hmm. But the fact remains that there's been no, uh, the solution offered by the Western countries and the rich is to further throw poorer countries into debt. And which is why one of the demands has also been for some kind of reform of the international financing system. Hmm. Like what is the point if uh, in order to support your, uh, your, in order to help your people who are suffering from climate disasters, yeah. you put more debt on them, right? Yeah. So that's horribly unfair. Yeah. And I think this is a key question that's going to come up again and again. Now, whether by the end of COP27, we are going to see an agreement on a, on a loss and damage fund is a big question. If so, what form will it take? Equally big question because, you know, there could be an in-principle agreement for a fund, mm. but the clauses, the details, the, the levels of the details could be so with. much yeah. that it won't ultimately work out to anything at all. So mm. that's a big question to consider. It's, I would say it's a good thing that it's by, it's on the agenda. Mm. Something at least uh, that's been asked for since the 90s. Exactly. And finally exactly. now being accepted yeah. as and, a requirement. And I think that globally, the, across the world, there is a recognition of both the need for this as well as its connection to colonialism, imperialism, yeah. exploitation. Yeah. But the, uh, I mean, it's a big question as to whether the richer countries which have been responsible for the bulk <clears throat> of the emissions, <clears throat> for instance, the United States is a huge chunk in yeah. this, whether these countries are going to actually sit down and say that, you know what, the it's our common our heritage, it's our common responsibility yeah. uh, over centuries Hundreds that we're this, talking yeah. about yeah. and let's now try to solve this well that will happen is a different question altogether yeah it comes back to like you were saying the structure in which all of this absolutely. is happening and absolutely and, all right uh, we'll ask you to stick around because we want also your insights on the next story uh we'll back in a minute a permanent cessation of hostilities has been agreed on between the ethiopian government and the tigrayan people's liberation front potentially bringing to an end two years of war and horrendous atrocities as things stand, the TPLF will disarm within 30 days and recognize the legitimacy of the government of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. But those who have been following the war have consistently noted that backed by the United States, the TPLF has created massive damage to the state and the people, including stealing aid, violating ceasefires 
and exploiting all kinds of ethnic conflicts to further its objectives. So what does the settlement mean? What, are the, what is the structure that it has? And perhaps most importantly, will the United States accept the prospect of peace? Prashant is still with us. He's been following the story closely and has all the details. Uh, Prashant, from what we know so far, what is the peace deal about? How is it structured? Right. So we have a very good detailed story from our colleague Pawan, which is on the site. So uh, this war has been going on for about uh, just about two years right now. It was, And the peace deal was signed the day before the second anniversary of the war. So basically what we, this context was this, the TPLF, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which was in power for in Ethiopia for 27 years, from the 90s onwards, they were restricted back to their state, which is Tigray. Mm. In 2020, they started the civil war, uh, which has gone on for two years, huge human rights, uh, you know, huge disaster in terms of rights, in terms of yeah, humanitarian crisis. Finally, a peace deal signed uh, under the leadership of the African Union. Uh, between the uh, Ethiopian government of Abiy Ahmed and the Tigray People's Liberation Front. Now, uh, the key aspect, the one important thing also, of course, note is that the TPLF by many uh, by many people consider it to be a proxy of the United States in the region. The TP US had backed the TPLF strongly when it was in control of Ethiopia mm. and uh, reportedly continues to do so even now. So, a couple of key things, of course. One is the fact that uh, for all ends and purposes, this marks uh, in various ways a surrender of the TPLF militarily because what the peace deal calls for is a disarmament of heavy weapons in a very, very short period of time and a complete right. disarmament in th within 30 days of the deal being signed, which is the first week of uh, December or so, of course, could be extended. Negotiations are going on between the government and the TPLF. Mm. It talks about the fact that the uh, there is a recognition that the only armed force in Ethiopia should be the Ethiopian military. Mm. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, it gives the possibility, it talks about the possibility of integrating the TPLF right. into the federal and democratic structures of the country. Mm. It talks about the pos it talks about the Ethiopian defense forces entering Tigray and assuming, you know, uh, whatever operational, uh, control, operational right. control of the region and federal government control of the region. Right. All of this are, is good on paper, of course. Now, mm. the big question, of course, how much of this will be implemented because mm. we do know that the TPLF has a bit of history of agreeing to ceasefires every time it has faced military setbacks. Right. And then, uh, you know, look at the right moment sort of uh, withdrawing from them and launching a fresh, uh, fresh assault. Mm. And we also know that, uh, you know, so that's a big question. So whether the ceasefire will hold is really something that a lot of people are, a lot of people are hoping for it, mm. but a lot of people are also rightly worried about uh, worried about it considering the TPLF's uh, previous experiences and right, its previous right, behavior so far. Right. Uh, of course, also backed by the United States, which uh, allows perhaps this rebuilding and uh, successive offenses to then take place. So what does uh, sort of the future look like uh, given all of these factors? Right, so I think two or three questions are very important here. One, the first of all is the question of whether, like, like we said, the TPLF will lay down arms properly, uh, whether the TPLF will permit other democratic forces to work inside Tigray itself, which will only, the, only then will the true democratic process be meaningful. What does it mean? Uh, there's a lot of internal debate about, uh, you know, certain other regions uh, which are part of the Amhara state, whether that uh, the Tigrayans will keep, try to keep control of those states, although they do belong to the state of Amhara itself. So there are questions of tensions around communities that are still not entirely settled. Uh, there is some amount of concern over the, some act, people have expressed concern over the fact that, you know, whether this agreement lets off the TPLF too easily without any real questions of justice, without any real questions of, you know, uh, the TPLF leaders being forced to answer for whatever they've been responsible for. But it also does look, there is a general, nonetheless there is a general sense of, uh, I, would use, I, would say, I wouldn't say enthusiasm, but some amount of, you know, hope in the sense that because I think there's also the question of the TPLF also had having to answer it to its own internal constituency. And the question of why this war even took place is a right. question that is going to be raised mm. against the TPLF leaders. So mm. that process is also likely to happen. Mm. So I think a lot depends in the coming weeks and months of how much of these processes which are defined by the peace agreement actually take place. Mm. And in good spirit, that's very important as well. So if the disarmament takes place properly and there is, uh, then there is a possibility of successful integration of the state more closely into the federal processes. So the Ethiopian government, on the one hand, will have to be watchful yeah. of you know any possibilities of rearmament or remobilization by the TPLF. Mm. On the other hand, it will also have to make sure that it is also, in that sense, it, it is open in the sense it is able to sort of give the people of Tigray the opportunity to sort of reintegrate as much as possible yeah. 
uh, while uh, say while moving out the rogue elements hmm. who wish to continue the conflict as well. So hmm. it's a bit of a, a difficult game for the Ethiopian government as well. Yeah. So it remains to be seen what's going to happen. Right. Perhaps Colombia, uh, for example, can offer a right. model there. Right. And I guess it's also important from a, a regional perspective. Absolutely. The Horn of Africa, yeah, bringing yeah. peace there, bringing regional cooperation there, yeah. very important very right important. now. Something the U.S. does not necessarily want yeah. because it would rather Doesn't prefer, yeah, rather prefer some amount of conflict over there. All right. Thanks very much, Prashant, for all of that. UK Minister of State for Trade and Member of Parliament Greg Hines is scheduled to visit Taiwan. The visit follows a series of trips, of course, by U.S. officials, including but not limited to Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. These visits are seen by Beijing and also neutral commentators as diplomatic escalations that come together with the U.S.'s policy of encirclement that appears the best solution Washington could come up with to hang on to its waning global hegemony. And of course, push the world into forever escalating arms races. Anish joined us via video conference uh, to talk more about all of these subjects. Anish, welcome back to the show. Uh, the visit in itself, not uh, the surprising part or the news point here, as much as the level at which it's taking place, uh, from what we've heard from the British government so far, what is the sort of objective or purpose of this trip? Well, the stated objective is that it is a trade talk between two countries, or at least between two governments. Uh, uh, whether or not Britain uh, con considers uh, Taiwan to be a separate country is a different thing altogether. Obviously, it doesn't in its official capacity, but it has uh, established, like many other Western nations, uh, very close ties uh, with Taiwan, especially in terms of trade and commerce. Uh, Britain and Taiwan has something like 8 billion uh, pounds of trade happening annually. So definitely there is something uh, that they would do. This has been, this is sort of like the fifth, 25th, I think, yeah, the 25th uh, annual meeting. And it is also the first in-person meeting since the pandemic started. Pandemic. Right. So, uh, but at the same time, as you pointed out, the level at which it is happening right now, there is a cabinet minister visiting the visiting Taiwan uh, at a time, uh, especially at a time when tensions are high in the region, uh, not just with China, but also between the two Koreas, uh, shows that there is something uh, definitely problematic about this visit and China uh, wants uh, that sort of, and coming just like barely a month after, uh, a month or two after, uh, Nancy Pelosi, the U.S. House Speaker, uh, made an official visit to Taiwan. It is definitely upping the ante uh, in terms of how U.S. allies are trying to deal with the region itself. Uh, on top of that, there is uh, another factor uh, that matters in this case, uh, which is how the wording happened. Because obviously Taiwan is trying to keep it quite very low key, or in the sense that it has not uh, divulged a lot, a lot of details about uh, how the visit will happen, the two-day visit will happen, what, what are the terms and conditions of the, uh, the talks, the agenda of the talks. Um, but uh, the British minister, Greg Hans, has already talked about uh, these two governments being uh, champions of democracy and uh, free trade. So definitely there is uh, also this ideological slant uh, behind this visit. And it is also, uh, even if they do not explicitly make any statements like Pelosi did uh, with her visit, uh, even if there is no statements by hands uh, in Taiwan, it can definitely hamper a lot of uh, any kind of attempt to lower the tensions in the regions, especially. So, Anish, we have talked several times on this show about how the U.S. has been approaching, and you mentioned Nancy Pelosi's visit as well, how the U.S. has been approaching uh, militarily, this uh, creating this policy of encirclement with regards to China, and how these diplomatic sort of offensive measures uh, fit into that uh, wider strategy with regards to, to China. So, from, from a neutral perspective or from a rest of the world perspective, uh, how problematic is it, this constant creation of flashpoints in a region that already has uh, so many political conflicts? Well, uh, it is uh, going to have long-term effects, uh, obviously, because as the election, we, are, we also need to know that much like when we talk about U.S. midterms, there's a midterm that will be happening in Taiwan as well. Local governments will be elected, and that is also where a lot of ideological standpoints will be up for debate, publicly speaking. And mm. you have the, what are, what are 
often called in the Western media the pro-Beijing and the anti-Beijing camp, uh, mm -hmm. going head to head on a lot of matters. Taiwan being uh, the champion, a champion of democracy, it is a problematic statement to make. So you're talking, trying to say that it has a separate political identity as separate from China, while you maintain an official policy that China as a whole includes Taiwan. Mm. So that is obviously a problematic statement to make. It, is, it also kind of uh, puts a whole lot of other things uh, in uh, into a volatile position, uh, especially when you talk about, not because the one China policy at the heart of it is uh, recognizing the sovereignty of China in dealing with its own conflicts. So whatever conflict may happen between Taiwan and China, it is something that has to be dealt with uh, by Taiwan and China and nobody else, ideally speaking. But that is what, uh, that's not happening at the moment. You already have nations making statements after statements, uh, making moves, uh, military moves even, uh, to supposedly uh, prevent the Ch Chinese in in invasion of Taiwan, as they say. And uh, you already have Japan trying to talk about rearming itself by 2027. Uh, you already have U.S. Uh, shifting uh, nuclear-capable bombers to Australia and South Korea. Uh, you have uh, a whole host of other issues. You have military drills happening, joint military drills happening, uh, not just uh, earlier, all of these were concentrated just against North Korea, but now it is something that is happening against China as well on a very, uh, on a larger scale. So all of these factors definitely are going to impact uh, relations entirely, but also it is going to put tensions at an all time high uh, when it comes to uh, China and not just China, but China and uh, Western high powers. Right. Thanks very much for that update, Anish. That's a wrap for this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll, of course, be back uh, tomorrow, same time, same place. Until then, for more details on all of these stories, we invite you, as always, to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. And don't forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice. Uh, we'll be back, same time, same place, like I said tomorrow. Until then, thank you for watching. Stay safe. Goodbye.